All right, uh, welcome everyone to um, the virtual interim for Ops AWG. This is in lieu of a person meeting in uh, Vancouver. We are on WebEx and this is a recorded session. Bringing up my share here. Are you uh, showing the slides? I am now. Hopefully, you can see it. I cannot. And how about any other people? Can anyone see the slides? Yes. 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 Okay. Hopefully, the lag will catch up. Um, as I said, is, uh, the virtual interim for Ops AWG. This session is being recorded. Um, if you've had difficulty joining with your computer, uh, try the call-in option. Uh, make sure video is off. Make sure you're muted unless you are speaking, uh, just because there will be a lot of background noise. Uh, you have the ability to uh, unmute yourself, but if there is background noise, we'll mute you. To join the mic line, just do a plus Q in the WebEx chat. Make sure everyone is selected. Um, and if you want to step out of the mic line, just do a minus Q. The Jabber room is there, um, opsawg at jabber.ietf.org. Um, I'm currently sharing and can't really monitor. Uh, Tianren uh, is, is out there looking at the WebEx chat and the Jabber. Uh, but if anyone says something substantive of Jabber, just have them go over to the uh, WebEx chat to join the mic line. There is a virtual blue sheet. Um, I'll get to that in a second. There is a virtual blue sheet. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we mentioned the Jabber uh, room. This is an official IETF, um, so the note well does apply. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have seen it, but it is up here. Be aware that anything you say here, anything that you uh, uh, type, these things are being recorded, these things are being tracked, so the note well applies there. Uh, Tian Ren and I are your hosts today. We did the note well, the blue sheet, uh, the virtual blue sheet, if you go to that Etherpad link, uh, there in the um, uh, minutes section there. You'll scroll all the way down to the bottom past the agenda. You'll see a register, a blue sheet register, where you can add your name and affiliation. Um, we're not really going to have a Jabber scribe, like I said, in meetings, the, these other virtual meetings I've attended. It's mainly been used as a side channel. If anyone wants to record something, uh, just come cue yourself. Uh, if you can't for whatever reason, um, uh, Tianren will uh, look or anyone there in the Jabber room can uh, act as a, a proxy or um, just let me know that there's something there and I can, I'm, I'm logged in as well. I can get out of this and, and go look at that. Um, the slides are posted at that link there. Uh, we will be going through them here, obviously, and we're all on the WebEx channel or WebEx meeting, but you can see the, uh, the link there as well. In terms of the agenda, we have the current status of our documents, and then we have, of course, a number of presentations. Good news is TechX, uh, the, the authors have uh, closed all the discusses, and the document is moving forward. Uh, Warren pushed that through, so I want to thank the working group, the authors who I don't believe are on today, for all the work and getting that forward. Because of that, the, uh, the Yang TechX uh, draft or TACX Yang module draft, um, we think is fairly stable. We'll do a um, working group last call after this. Uh, network, uh, network telemetry framework, uh, they've incorporated uh, recent feedback from Adrian Farrell, and they also think it's ready for a last call. Um, so we can push that out there. Uh, the SDI, um, uh, the secure device uh, onboarding work that Warren and Colin we're working on. Michael Richardson did a, uh, did a shepherd write up of that. Uh, and then now we're getting all this additional feedback from Tom. And Michael's also chiming in there. So there's been some revision to that, and there likely be some more before uh, it, it's finally submitted to the IESG um, for uh, further work. We put out a sector request uh, for review. We didn't get one there, but uh, regardless, when it uh, if, if we don't get something on the security side when it goes through the uh, the ADs, and Warren has also reached out to do an AD to 
to look it over. It, it will get eyes on. Um, the L3SM, L3NM, and the uh, uh, automation framework, um, those are going to be presented today. Um, anything else to add on this, Tanner? Great. Okay. So the other thing we've added is a Ops AWG uh, GitHub uh, organization. Uh, we've got two uh, documents being worked there. If uh, just like any other uh, a GitHub organization for a working group, if their desire to move a project there, uh, let uh, Tianren and I know and we can add it as members. This is, of course, you don't have to be a member to contribute. Um, you can go here now and, and look at these projects. Uh, if you want to use them for issue tracking um, or obviously the version control, uh, by all means, we, we have that set up now. And we have some boilerplate uh, kind of note well um, markdown that you can use as well if you're interested in, in moving a project there. In terms of the presentations, we're going to be front loaded with some of the working group items, the things that have already been adopted. We, we saw that two of them will be uh, presented today. So you see the layer three in the network automation framework. Uh, then we kind of group things together where they fit. We've got some additional related to the L3 work there. Uh, we've got the mud hour right in the middle, uh, sampled traffic streaming. We heard from uh, Andrew last time, but we'll hear again. Uh, then we have uh, iFit, we have uh, Benoit, unfortunately he's under the weather. Um, I'm with some uh, notes from him, we'll present that um, and we'll finish out with something that was uh, initially AD sponsored, um, uh, but requires uh, some more eyes on, I think, and that's that uh, uh, IP fix uh, packet sampling protocol and bulk data export work. Um, there are some additional drafts if we have time. This is a packed agenda. If we have time, there are two others. It's in the agenda on the Etherpad. Uh, we might get to it, but knowing history, we probably won't. I asked the authors, the presenters, please be cognizant of your time slots and, and do your best to fit in that. And finally, we'll move over to ops area. There is uh, some open mic time. Uh, with that, are there any questions on the agenda? Excellent. I would also like to say that we have a new uh, Ops AD in Rob Wilton. He's joined us. He's on the call. Um, welcome, Rob. Thank you for uh, stepping up to be the Ops uh, Management, I believe, AD. And um, I'm sure you will have a more formal introduction in the Ops area section, but I'm, I'm very glad you and Warren are both here joining us uh, this morning, evening, or afternoon. With that, Let's get our first presenter queued up. Hopefully you're all still seeing this. And I believe Chin, you are presenting. I will uh, do the needful with the next slide. So please unmute yourself, Chin Wu, and take it away. Assuming he's here. I don't see him. Oh, there he is. Chin, are you there? Can anyone hear me? Yep. yep. Thank you. you are. Let me see if Chin no problem. the list. Yeah. I don't see a mic against his name. I did. He's got his headphone icon I there. Headphones, yeah. I see. Uh, well, he seems to be having audio issues. He muted and unmuted. Give him a minute, and I will ask uh, um, if he can't get situated quickly. Uh, Oscar, would you be willing to go, and we can just flip you, yeah, flip you two around? Yeah, yeah. yes. We, I can start the the next presentation while while Chin solves his. Okay. So Chin, if you can hear us, we're going to do that. We're going to let Oscar do his first, get back to you, and then we'll flip back to Oscar. Um, so with that slight agenda bash here, Oscar, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, uh, guys. 
And let me know if there is any, you can hear me properly? Yes, we can, you sound great, thanks. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna send you the today the updates of the Layer 3 VPN network Jan model. <clears throat> just to uh, just go to the to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you which are the updates from the 01 uh, version, uh, which is the last one that was presented in the, the last ITF meeting. Now we are in the 03 version. We submitted one uh, version last week uh, just to there were some <clears throat> some uh, issues to to close that we did not have time when submitting the O2 version so i uh, so there we have the O3 now so then uh, after this uh, set of update i'm going to tell you some going to some specific sessions where we had uh, or some parts of the draft that we had uh, more advances the the multicast, the out assignment, which was one of the open issues in the, the last one, and also highlight one of the collaborations that we had with TIAS for the for the service mappings and then go to the next steps. So please go to the next slide. So which are the changes? So first of all, we have some new contributors. So we have Lucia, eh, Manolo, and Nerez. Eh, so they have done great contribution. So especially the, the L3, the multicast L3 VPN uh, was completed. Uh, then also we have many, many new insights and uh, refinements uh, thanks to the, the contributions. So now I think the document is quite, is quite good. So we have the, as you mentioned earlier, we have the um, official uh, L3 NM repository in the OPSA working group uh, repository uh, github uh, group so here you can go there uh, check all the all the issues all the pull requests that people have been contributing all the all the commits so here we have uh, 38 issues closed uh, and and uh, each of these issues have been discussed in the calls that we make regularly or either in the mails or sometimes the, the discussion you can see it there the discussion in the in the jit I encourage guys to, uh, to always to try to to leave there the the comments uh, contributing and commenting in the GitHub is like contributing on the on the mailing list. Okay, so uh, it stays it stays there. So you see that there was a lot of activity with 264 commits. So so it's uh, been quite uh, quite active the this one. So regarding the changes themselves, so as I mentioned, the the multicast support was uh, uh, completely re uh, was revised uh, and updated, and we validated against the um, uh, real use case. So it was the IPTV multicast for of Telefonica based on L3 VPN. So we um, tested that everything, uh, at least against a, a real use case. Uh, was, uh, was needed. Uh, then there was some request to support uh, some more complex uh, import and export profiles. Uh, so we added the possibility to create and and or operations between communities. So, so for example, uh, two targets or two other targets as shown in the, in the example. So now this is possible to add it in the, uh, to request that uh, through the model. Uh, also, uh, we had a, uh, an issue with the, how to identify uh, the VPN network access. Just to remind you that the, the VPN network access uh, is the point that enters the traffic into the into the VPN. So there, uh, we added the port ID to clearly identify which is the the interface or sub interface uh, in a topology. Previously, we had just the, the VPN network access ID with it's just an ID. So I think separating the concept is much better. So also we checked a lot, the, the, we had a lot of requests uh, coming from the uh, many operations uh, requesting uh, to be able to express through the model uh, some BGP parameters. So just remind that this is not a um, device model. So we wanted to uh, be able to pass through the, uh, through the network model only those BGP parameters that are uh, essential and they have, they have real operational needs. 
Uh, also, we added one additional CEP routing protocol, ISIS, because we identified one use case uh, that uh, a request from an operation that required it. So, next slide, please. Um, before I do that, I, I put myself in the queue. Um, you mentioned that you're tracking issues in GitHub, and, and that's fine. Um, but this is a working group document, and I would ask that if there are any decisions, anything that you, you need working group uh, consensus buy-in on, that, that the list is the canonical place to go. So please be sure you're taking those things to the list. The, the GitHub isn't a replacement for that. It's, it's great for working collaboratively, but some of those things do need to come back so the working group has visibility into, into that work that's happening. Okay, so then let me do the following after the after the meeting let me try to get all the discussions main discussions uh, there to the to the list taking them from a summary of each of the discussions that happened in in the jit and that drove to a decision okay so people Thank can you. can work on that okay perfect okay thanks so then uh, we had uh, solved the auto assignment issue that we uh, had in the last uh, ITF. This one, we solved it uh, querying the, through the mailing list. So here, are the, as I'm going to explain later, uh, we made the RT assignment optional. Previously, it was mandatory, so that is uh, now changed. And uh, we added uh, some uh, a way to express some preferences on uh, the underlay. So we can in, so the operator or the service orchestration layer can indicate his preferences. So if you want uh, LDP, if you prefer VPT tunnels, if you prefer cement routing, etc. But the service mapping itself, for example, if you need to map to, to tunnels, is uh, done in a document with the TS. So also we, we did some minor changes like uh, in, in the VPN node only have the network element ideas a key. So for each node in the network, uh, you can have only one VPN node for that particular VPN. And we have clarified as requested in the in the last ITF meeting, the relations with other young modules. So especially with L3SM, uh, which are the relations. Even we added a pointer to uh, a reference to the L3SM. So you can match. So you can, if a service is, uh, has been triggered because of an L3SM request, if the pointer to the L3SM ID is added. And also we added a list of potential service modules that can be used. Also, we clean the young module. Please go to the next slide. Um, and uh, we review the test and we added some samples of the use of L3NM. We added some examples and also we added uh, one more implementation by SE Telecom that contacted us. So we know that there are more implementations around. So just um, including them is a matter of the management approval um, and so on. Uh, so in sake of time, please go to the next next slide. I'll try to be quick. So in the BGP parameters that we added, so we had a request to add, uh, we reviewed, these are the, the ones that finally were chosen to be added to the, mod, to the module. So the BGP description, so people wanted to express their, which is the, the string that will uh, go and pass down later. So it is uh, it facilitates the uh, troubleshooting, the administrative and operational status. So to check the health of the pitching session directly from the L3NM, the local autonomous system. So you can overwrite the, the autonomous system. Uh, we have seen use cases in reality while the VPN has one AS and what you show to the customer is another uh, different AS. So here you can overwrite it and in the security allowed encryption in the BGP CEP session. Please go to the next slide. Uh, also, we, uh, as mentioned, we had a lot of work to uh, to support, to finalize support of multicast. So we updated the multicast uh, container, which is managed at the VPN node level now. We added an Anycast uh, container. We added a couple of leads, the local address, uh, which identifies the IP address of the local render point. Uh, also, we added uh, a set of uh, RP addresses. So these are all the IP addresses from all the router that set the same render was point. Uh, we modified the name to clarify the name because we had a parameter called the single address. Um, however, it was uh, not quite full. So now 
we change it to group prefix, uh, which is much uh, clear the, 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 the role of that parameter, and added the, the MSDP protocol container. Uh, so with with the several leaves, so if it's enabled or not the protocol, the peer, the local address, so to configure the, the multi-source rediscovery protocol. Uh, and we added also, uh, and we removed the the customer tree flavor con container. And for each of the accesses, uh, we added the remote source uh, leaf. So we can go to the next slide because I think we don't have much much time. So the auto assignment, we had three possible behaviors that then they need to control your time. Yes. Okay, yes. So I think this this was discussed in the mailing list. Uh, uh, we had we queried NetMod for the for guidance. So finally, uh, we included a solution uh, proposed on the on this feedback. So include explicitly in the description of the junk the the behavior that if it's not no leaf is created, the entity must have auto assign a value, and that in the value itself include an empty type that means that you don't want any value to be assigned. So please go to the next next slide. This is a joint work uh, with Tias for the service mapping. So it's to be able to uh, identify which are the set of LSPs uh, or virtual network or tunnels that are associated to a given service. So here you have the reference and I think yes, it will be presented on, on Tias. But it's a collaboration with, with Tias. So go to the next slide and I finalize the presentation. Uh, so we now, after all the the changes and discussions uh, among all the uh, all the authors, we think now that the the young modules is, is stable. So we are now in, um, we believe that we can go for the young doctor review. So we think that there won't be any major changes now in the structure and so on. So just some tweaking in the text might might be needed just to to finalize the uh, even there are some points that might not be clear and so on we can work on that and we ask the working group to review this version of the um, of the document uh, so so we can go and uh, have a uh, finalize it uh, in a couple of in a couple of months okay. so that's all thank you questions for oscar see anyone coming in the queue um I, I noted your yang doctor review we can uh, we can get that um uh, put in for you after this uh and we talked about just those those decisions those kind of uh what you need the the working group to weigh in on especially because you're asking for the review just summarize that from github please okay um so you're still on deck but chin has told me he's back chin can you hear me Can't hear you, Chin. Oh, were you calling user five? I call uh, through the phone. Can, can you hear Chin, me? Is that I, we can hear you now? Oh. Okay, so I'm going to put your presentation okay, back yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Put your presentation back up here, and can you hopefully you can see because it's going to be kind of hard to present if you yeah. can't. Okay. Um, take it away then. Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chen Sorry Wu. about that. Actually, uh, I got a trouble to join. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, hello. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. You sound Go fine. Ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah, Go yeah. ahead. Oh, okay. Maybe there's okay. So this uh, chapter talk about a young model automation framework, uh, and uh, I'm here to present this. And uh, this uh, actually uh, is a joint work with many operator. And uh, the name we list here are also this draft. Uh, next. Next. Yeah. Uh, for people who uh, don't know what, what this job is talking about, actually, the target audience for this job is uh, operator and young model developers and implementers. And uh, I, I think the big uh, challenge faced by the operator when they uh, deploy young data model at a different layer is uh, how. how uh, how, how these models put together to uh, provide the service 
uh, delivery and uh, to, uh, to 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 realize the service of fulfillment. So this draft really provides guidance uh, to show how this model model put together uh, for service fulfillment and service delivery. And uh, the architecture we propose in this draft, uh, we identify the common functionality that can be used by multiple models. This can help to uh, build the fully young based system. So also we actually give uh, several examples to show how this uh, common functionality can be used, uh, where they can be used. Uh, next. Uh, so what, what is the current status of this job? This job has already been adopted by the OPS WG uh, since uh, uh, last uh, Singapore meeting, and but uh, this draft uh, has been around for a while, and uh, this outcome uh, uh, of the Young Study meeting in uh, last year, actually, the change we made uh, since the uh, 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 last version, actually, we tried to address the, the, the comments raised in last Singapore meeting. One of the comments from uh, uh, from Lauren, actually, he uh, what he suggests, actually, is to move service decommission from the network level, level to the service level, which so we try to address this. Also, we got comments from uh, Diego uh, actually uh, to try to clarify the service verification, uh, the position actually uh, clarify the relationship between the service verification and the service creation and modification. In addition, actually, we add a, a new figure, try to add more details about the service attribute and uh, clean up the reference and uh, we also add a, a, a new use cases uh, um, for the telemetry, event-based telemetry automation. And uh, so, uh, yeah, also we try to complete the security section um, and make it more uh, complete. Yeah, next. So model layer, uh, model layering and representation compared with the previous version actually we add more details about uh, service attribute that uh, 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 be defined in the service requirements. Uh, uh, actually, this uh, service attribute can be classified uh, as a several categories, for example, connectivity, uh, flow identification, traffic acceleration, uh, routing and forward, uh, forwarding, uh, et cetera. And uh, for other part, actually, it is uh, the same as, as the, 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 uh, the, the, the previous we, we, we proposed. Next. Uh, this, this is architecture for the service and manage, uh, network uh, management automation. Actually, uh, based on the comments from the, uh, Lauren, actually, we actually move the service decommission uh, to the uh, service layer. In addition, actually, we add uh, uh, one uh, 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 bottle up uh, feedback from the network orchestrator to the service orchestrator. Uh, we can provide the uh, service assurance uh, notification. And uh, for us, uh, actually, uh, important part of like uh, multi-layer, multi-domain service mapping and uh, domain specific uh, service uh, decomposition decompos actually the same as uh, we proposed before. Uh, next. Okay. So, uh, so the change we made, actually, this uh, is a use case we proposed in this job. Uh, it, it talk about the uh, L3 VPN service delivery. We use uh, L3 uh, SM, L2 uh, NM as an example to, uh, here actually, we just provide a top-down service delivery, but what is missing actually is when you get a service deployed by the operator, uh, so operator also care about whether service get deployed successfully. Another case is when you get a service set up or get a network set up, you really need to care about what is the network performance look like actually. So we. So it is like the feedback from uh, lower layer to the uh, upper layer. Uh, so we, so uh, in in this uh, version, we add uh, the, the the feedback from uh, orchestrate, uh, from the controller to the orchestrator. Also add the feedback from the orchestrator to the uh, to the customer. Next slide. So this feedback, or uh, we we call the L3 NM notification or capability exposure, actually. And uh, on top of the auxiliary, we also add the notification. All of, all of these feedback or notification can be used uh, for many purposes. One of the purposes actually can, can be used for the billing or accounting actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so this also uh, very important to, to provide the service assurance, uh, build the closed loop uh, management. Next. Mm -hmm. 
So th this is the three use cases that we, we uh, propose in this draft. Actually, the, the first two cases, as I uh, clarified, we added the missing piece, added the feedback in the first case is about S3 VPN service delivery. For the second case, we, we don't make any change, actually, but also it uh, you know, can provide service assurance using uh, the performance measurement and telemetry model. And uh, uh, also we add the third case is we can support uh, event-based telemetry automation. The, the idea is, uh, you know, you can uh, delegate the network control uh, logic to the device uh, uh, and populate the uh, policy uh, from the controller to the device. So the device can provide the device uh, self, uh, uh, self uh, management, uh, provide a quick response to, to the events, actually. And uh, this, so this uh, change we, we made, actually, um, this, this uh, case actually also can uh, build the closed loop of management within the device. Uh, next. So we, we think uh, this job uh, uh, reaches uh, completion. Actually, uh, what is the missing piece is about the service assurance. Actually, we already you know added the uh, notification capability exposure from the lower layer to the upper layer. And uh, talking with uh, our co-author and uh, editor, and uh, we, we think maybe we consider to add another example to show how this service assurance uh, can uh, can, can, can be performed. So we uh, uh, would like to hear more comments uh, raised in this meeting, and we hope we can request a working last call in June um, uh, to get this work done. That's all. Thank you. Uh, comments and uh, suggestions, feedback? Yeah. Ching? Uh, this, yeah. this is Tianran. Um, yeah, you mentioned the yeah. service assurance and BI many times in, uh, in the slides. Is there any connection to the work the Benoit proposed uh, uh, that we'll present later? Yeah, there's some uh, some connection. I think the service assurance architecture proposed by Benoit actually provide more, you know, abstract architecture. The, what he need is, you know, you do the translation uh, between the technology independent metric, uh, performance metric, uh, to the technology specific performance metric. In, in, our, uh, uh, mode, in our architecture we proposed actually, we, you know, we, uh, we can leverage young data model uh, and also uh, young push telemetry mechanism to, to uh, develop uh, some uh, loss bound interface performance uh, measurement model to aggregate the performance metric. And uh, this is more, you know, uh, you know connect the metric uh, from the underlying network. So what he proposed actually seems, uh, you know, build the overlay uh, uh, architecture, they, but they uh, may rely on the, you know, metric uh, tra you know, translation or metric engine to do the translation between, you know, the, the, the technology independent metric and uh, technology specific metric. Yeah, that, that's uh, uh, some, something, uh, can, you know, uh, relationship between two work. Okay. Is there any other comments? I would uh, say that, that on what you have up here, Chin, um, about adding another example and comments raised in the meeting, um, if you've got specific questions of the working group, what example you might want to add, I would just bring that back to the list to get more uh, people looking at it and, and more input. Um, ahead of uh, any uh, last calls. Are there any re additional expert reviews you want uh, at this point, like an early review um, in this document? Yeah, I'm not sure we can request a young doctor review, but uh, this is a, you know, just architecture draft, uh, maybe uh, nothing uh, young doctor can do about it. And But, uh, you know, for the example, we uh, I, I will talk with my uh, co-author, uh, you know, Matt actually about this example and bring back to the list when we come, uh, when, when we uh, uh, sort out this kind of example. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, thank you. I would, uh, I put it in the chat, but I'm going to say it again. Um, if you haven't filled in your name in the virtual blue sheet in the etherpad, uh, please do so. The link is a lot of places. It's also in the WebEx chat window. Thank you, Chin. Uh, Oscar, we're going yeah, to move thank you. back to you. Uh, 
So this time it was five minutes, right? Yep. And back to Oscar Gonzalez de Dios. Okay, thank you very much. So now, uh, before we presented the layer three VPN network model, now uh, we received uh, similar requests to uh, uh, do the okay. same work for layer two. So uh, this is precisely the um, doing, uh, doing that, particularly for layer two VPN. So go to the next slide, please. So what is the, the motivation? So we, we already have a L2SM model uh, that captures the, the VPN service from the client uh, point of view. So in order to deliver the service, we needed this more network centric view that takes uh, or digs more into the network details. So we have this new module, this L2NM, this is a young module to manage this provisioning of the layer 2 VPN service in the service provider network scope. So uh, we can use it also to, uh, to derive the configuration, the, the detailed configuration of the devices and the underlying transport uh, that you need. Okay, so um, please go to the, to the next slide. I don't have much time. So what is the, we try to maintain the same module structure as in the as in L3 VPN. So uh, in some cases you might not need all the uh, all the information. So depend because this uh, this module aims to cover all the different types of um, of L2 VPNs. Okay. So uh, but the general concept is the same. We have the everything pivots around the VPNs. VPN service, so the young module contains the list of VPN service in the service provider uh, network managed by that controller that has a VPN nodes uh, in all the points that you want to have uh, connections to the to the VPN and you have VPN network accesses, that is where the traffic uh, comes. So you, uh, the relation is one to N or zero to N, zero to N. Okay, so please next slide. Um, so, uh, we applied inside the service provider network, so that is between PEs, so that is the the border of the um, uh, of the VPN or the L2NM scope. Here we need to support point to multi point, point to point, and multi point to multi point services, and also uh, be able to select which is the underlying. A transport that you that you want, whether it is IPMPLS, whether it is VDP, segment routing, we also want to express that uh, preference in the model. So please, next, next slide. So here is the, the main slide. Okay, so uh, which are the the highlights of the of the of the module? So so we started from what was existing in 2SM, and we added the pieces that were needed to fit the network view. So, for, uh, for example, support uh, new service types, for example, eVPN. Okay, so here, there, uh, I think there is a lot of work now in BES for doing the device uh, device modules to support eVPN. So I think this is the piece that fits uh, in the middle. Uh, support you know, all the legacy access technologies. So we need to support uh, Ethernet, circuit emulation, etc. So we have many kind of accesses. Uh, mentioned before requesting the underlay transport protocol preference, so where we want BGP, where we want LDP, segment routing TE, etc. Uh, support redundancy, so we have uh, in re remote terminations, support some parameters of, for example, the target or distinguisher for the BGP, BPLS, and uh, support the administrative and, uh, and operation status. So these are the, the main additions of the module. So next slide, please. So if you want to contribute uh, now, we have the in a private JIT, where we are using the same procedure, track issues, and receive comments. Also, please use the list also not to, we, sometimes they, they compete, the JIT uh, and, the, and the list. Uh, there are some issues that uh, have been, uh, are discussed to, to improve the, the, the model, uh, for example, the, the the service mapping we have already done a collaboration with 
with TIAS also to include uh, this uh, L2 uh, mapping, mapping there. And also we have uh, also some contributes or uh, some implementations on the way. So go to the next slide, please, and then we finalize. So here we we request the working group to review this document uh, to see if it's useful, uh, see any flaws, anything that you, you want to add. So we want to fix these issues and comments from the reviews. And if <coughs> at some point you think it's worth uh, working as a working group and not just an individual, um, it also would be great. Okay, and with this, I finalize the presentation. Thank you very much. We have two uh, two people in the queue. Uh, Jinbin Li, you're first. Okay, Osaka, can you hear me? Uh, Oscar, I have the two questions. Uh, the first uh, question, I see that you have the open issues for the EVPN support. I'm not sure is the uh, I'm not sure if the EVPN is not supported uh, in this draft or just some uh, cases of EVPN are not supported by this. Draft. I think we started to add the the, EV, the EVPN support. I think we we added it in the last version of the of the draft. So now now it is uh, supported. I think it was in L2SM where it was not uh, not supported. And but maybe uh, what what we need to check if if all the parameters that are required for later triggering the EVPN uh, device models are available or not. So that that work of um, reviewing all the EVPN support is needed. So right now it's just a, a type. So you can request an EVPN type. Okay, so there is, a, there is work to do. Okay, okay. I, I see. Uh, the second question is that uh, uh, I say that the L2 VPN, uh, most of the L2 VPN features uh, are supported. I want to know because the L2 VPN is a little complex. I want to know for the HVPRs, I mean, the hierarchical uh, L2 VPN can be supported by this uh, uh, service model or not. I would say. Yes, but I don't know whether uh, I would need to review whether everything needed is there or not. We will need to we will need to review it. Okay, so uh, uh, how about the uh, inter AS uh, uh, scenario? Inter AS L2 VP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think yes, but maybe some of the the co-authors can also want to if some of the co-authors want to answer. Yes, the hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Samir here. Uh, the inter IS scenario is one of the use cases that we have uh, been planning to support. Currently in the model, uh, we support the selection of the transport protocol or the underlay transport protocol. So inter IS uh, option C was of the target use case that we were expecting to solve so in this case we could select bgp as the transport protocol and we can configure or assign also the remote address of the the termination point of the bpls so in this case the inter is uh, deployment is supported however we are still enhancing the set of network parameters that we require for the Hierarchical BPLS, for example, and other use cases that we have in our network. Um, in, in the interest of time, uh, I think this is a discussion for the list, um, especially since you're you're looking to get that feedback. I, I, I'd like to go to the next person in the in the mic line to Italo Busi, uh, so we can clear this out. 
Okay. Please take uh, this conversation you. to the list. Uh, Italo. Uh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, there is a comp another draft uh, in uh, a SICAM working group uh, which is addressing a, a similar problem. Uh, it's mainly focusing on traffic engineering, so there may be missing pieces, but there is a lot of overlapping uh, apparently between uh, this draft and the SICAM working group draft. Have you considered the, that and the relationship between these two documents? Uh, which is the document that you are referring? Can you point the or type the signals, reference? The it client signals yes. model. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the client signal uh, model was more aimed at the, the pure transport part, right? Not uh, Ethernet VPNs. We we need to, to to check out if there are any potential overlaps. There are Ethernet services that can be supported over over transport and are also covered by the draft. Yeah. Okay, we can talk about that. And Rob, uh, yes. So, can you hear me, okay, Joe? Uh, you're a little yeah. tiny, but you're you're clear, more or less. <laughs> so, my my question is more a meta question here. So, we've got uh, two examples of network Yang models here. Uh, I have lots of has lots of devicable Yang models. I'm trying to understand is how much work is there in the general area of network wide Yang models? Is it just going to be uh, an L3, an L2, uh, maybe an L1 network model, or is there going to be extra models for covering various features from a network-wide perspective? So my question to the authors uh, and maybe to the working group is, how much work is there in this general area? Um, is this something that we should be focusing a separate working group perhaps on, on this area, or is having an OPS AWG the correct place? Have a thought on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, or right now, or the kind of services that we were started to to focus in were on these two because they were the ones that were more uh, popular in our network. So they say from from network operating operator perspective, those are the ones today. So should new services appear, okay, we would expand it. But for now, as I think as pointed out correctly in in Chin's presentation, uh, there are regarding these two main services or network-wide services that are presented today, there are gaps around it. So with these two drafts, we are focusing on some specific, uh, just the provisioning part. So we think we need to solve uh, or to work on solving gaps around that uh, more than right now in our view to, to add more services. So th this, if there are more services, that required by operators, of course, there will be more more work. But for now, uh, service-wide perspective, those two are the ones that are, I think, for us as operators, we see more. We see okay. Okay, thank you. So, it sounds like for now the scope is fairly limited or or restricted at least, and it fits where it is. But it sounds like if there are going to be a proliferation of this, maybe that question could be revisited. That's heard it yeah okay um that clears the line thank you very much oscar thank you uh next up we have med med bukader on uh, a yang model for user network interface topologies med can you hear us Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yes. So this um, this presentation will be about the uh, the user network interface. So this will be, I would say, the uh, a natural continuation of the two models that were pre presented by Oscar. The one about the L3 uh, NM and the um, the L2 NM. And actually, we um, we um, we uh, decided to edit this draft as a, sep as a separate one because there is, a, I would say. It's it's not specific to a given service, but it can apply to um, to um, multiple services. So if you can to the next slide, please. Um, so basically, um, uh, I would just um, describe the I would say the um, the issue why we need this kind of, of models. Then to uh, to present you, I would say 
um, briefly the, um, the overall structure and then um, to discuss some next steps on the drive. So if you can move to, to, to the next slide, please. Um, so this is just, I would say, a simple view of the, I would say, of um, just um, um, a network in which we have multiple customers. Each of these customers have their own sites. And these sites, they are connected to, uh, to services that are delivered by a given provider. So each of these customers has its own view of the service which is provided by, by I would say, by the network. As can be uh, shown in the next slide, uh, for instance, if we focus on the, I would say, on the block customer, the block customer, what it sees, it, it, it sees, the next slide, please. Um, what it will see, it will see, um, I would say, a topology in which he has its, its customer, the um, each devices that are interconnected and has, they have connectivity by some magic, which is provided by, I would say, by the network provider, and sometimes by multiple providers, and all what it sees is this topology. And But now, if we go down to, to, to the um, network provider, as we can see in the next slide, we will have, I would say, the, no, it's, we will see uh, at the service level, which is, I would say, the ESM, uh, 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 which provide, I would say, an abstraction of the service, which is provided to these customers in, um, or to these multiple, I would say, sites. All what we see, we see the, um, I would say, an interconnection of sites. We don't even have the devices. And then we, when we translate the L3 SM uh, service model into um, uh, the L3 uh, network model, as can be shown in the next slide, we will see right now that the the service, uh, so we have the same service, but we have multiple views. And now what we have, we have only the, I would say, the interconnection between the um, the um, uh, the provider edge routers. And there's this topology, which is only shown uh, at the, and maintained by a network controller. So there is something which is really missing here, which if we want to have the gap between the service, which has seen by the customer as the service as um, um, uh, perceived and seen by the network provider, um, we have something which is really missing in the next slide, please, uh, which is where to deliver the service. And this can be answered by including, uh, by, by defining or by including a reference into the interfaces that will be shown in the next slide uh, that we, we call the user network interfaces. So the, this reference points are important to have the gap between, I would say, the overall service which should be provided and delivered to a, to a customer and the, the current view we have at the, at the network level. So um, if we enrich the information which is provided at the L3 uh, NM, I would say, um, a level with the various reference points that are pointing to the interfaces that are used to deliver the service, we'll have something which is more uh, rich. So that in the next slide, for, uh, for instance, we will see that the network controller now has, I would say, the uh, a holistic view on all the, I would say, the point in which it can, it can deliver the service. So the network topology we have today in the uh, that are defined in various models in the ATF can be enriched with this information about the, uh, the user network interface with a focus on the I would say on the provider side we don't focus on the uh, customer side because with already the, the current topology models already provide this kind of, of views so if you can move to the next slide please we will see that this is the, um, uh, the I would say the simplified I would say the uh, model of the user network interface so we we are adding this uh, service attachment points with um, um, with identifiers as, as and also with uh, more information about the encapsulation type that can be enabled on our pro interface. Next slide, please. So for, for for this model, we 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 could decide to to have this I would say this this structure included in the um, L3 and M um, uh, draft that we have already adopted in OPSA working group. But the point is that this this kind of I would say information is not specific to a given service, and it can be uh, reused by other uh, services uh, or models. For instance, the uh, layer two and network models and so on. So it's it's not really specific to a service. So what we know to uh, what we would like to to hear from the working group um, um, is um, a direction for this work, whether we maintain it as a separate or we can just maintain it on the um, one of the current models and uh, that are already presented by Oscar, for instance, the layer two NM or into the layer three network model. That's and my presentation. Thanks, Med. Uh, Italo Busi is uh, in line. The mask. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, a similar comment to the previous one. We have a similar draft yet adopted as working group uh, in Seacamp uh, because we have exactly the same problem when we set up a, a client service over a transport network. Uh, it's that uh, you need to know 
the UNIs, which I agree is generic, but also you need to know uh, the not all the, uh, I know some, some boxes are, for example, in layer two are able to do uh, VLAN uh, um, classification. Some are based on one, some are based on two, some are not based, are, are just doing internet frame based mapping. So the UNI discovery is something generic, but the capability are, are specific and we have some work already in SICAM, so I think we need to reconcile a little bit uh, the solutions. Yeah, pl please just send, send us a, a pointer to your document and let's work together on, on pushing this forward. Fine, yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, and I have a question. Yeah, I have a clarification question. What's the type of this kind of model? I mean, the service model or network model or device model? This one is a, it's, it for me, it's, um, I would say, a topology model, which will um, augment I mean, the current, I would say, the, the current network topology, which is already, uh, I would say, specified in existing RFCs, yeah. I mean, who will uh, consume this model? Yeah, uh, network control, L2, network controllers. L2 LM, L2 LM, L3 LM, or L3 SM? All of them can, can consume that model. All of them can consume this model. What's the abstraction layer? It's a... Because right now, right now there are several kinds of models. The service models were abstracted, and also the network model, like L two NM, and the device model for devices. So, it could be used for all of them. Uh, this is Oscar. Uh, if we go for the Jin Wu's presentation at the at the beginning with the two with the network control layer and the service orchestration layer, I think this uh, this topol this is a topology view that can be exposed by the network controller to the service orchestration layer, telling from which points can service be instantiated. So then the service orchestration layer can use uh, the L, either the L3NM or the L2NM to request. Uh, the desired services in the uh, potential endpoints that were shown by the UNI topology. Okay, can I see this is a new kind of um, service abstraction? And maybe in, in that framework document that could describe this kind of things. Are you going to uh, explain or ask questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, I have to unmute call in user five here. Chin, go ahead. Chin, can you hear us? We cannot hear you. He's muted, I think. I unmuted him. It appears in. At least in my screen, he appears. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Please. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm muted. I'm muted. A so simple answer to the uh, Tian's question. Actually, UNI topology model is a network level model, similar to the uh, network topology model that has already been published. Actually, as uh, Med Mohammed uh, clarified. So, yeah, we definitely we can show this UNI topology usage. In, in the young model automation uh, act framework draft, uh, yeah. Okay. Does this answer your question? Yes. And next, uh, Rob. Okay, thank you. I just try to understand how these fit together. You're saying it complements both the L2NM and L3NM models. I don't know how they fit together. Is the expectation then that this would augment both of those Yang models, or does there need to be an underlying uh, generic uh, network model that both uh, that this augments and so does L2 and L3 and M? So I'm just questioning exactly how all these different Yang models are meant to fit together the network. This is actually shown in the um, in the previous slide. Yeah. If you please, if you can just move. Um... When we we describe what we call the I would say the the previous one, please. Uh, previous one. 
Thank you. So here, we, we, when we see what, what you see, the L train M, which is, I would say, covering the scope, which is only between, I would say, the provider edge um, uh, router themselves. This, this, is, this is what covers by the L train M. And then when we add this, I would say, the UNI to, to, to topology, we include this, I would say, this missing piece, which is the uh, demarcation point between the P and the C router. Um, so that's why we, we, we on purpose, say that we are comp the, the two models will complement each other to provide the overall tool to deliver the overall service, which can be um, modeled in another service. So the complementary here is, is in matter, of, I would say, in matter of scope of the network scope. The user network interface is, 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 is really what, what, it, what, what it said in the name. This is it's really specific to the demarcation point between the P router and the CR routers. And the existing, uh, I would say, the l 2 nm or l 2 nm will just cover, I would say, the PM between the, um, the, the various devices themselves that are um, including the, I would say, the equipment provided by, by, this, by the provi pro net net network provider. So it's a matter of scope. It, that means that we have multiple scopes. One, one of them is, is really specific, I would say, to, um, uh, to, uh, to specific legs in the uh, overall architecture. Okay. I think I'm not, I still in my mind, I don't have a clear, I'll need to read the drafts on how these things fit together um, as to whether you're augmenting or you're expecting yours to sit alongside. But I'd have thought there needs to be some bindings between the L2NM model and the L3NM model and your uni model. Yeah. Uh, that's in the list, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next up, uh, Tiru. You ready? Uh, are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Take it away. Hello. Yeah. hello, everyone, I'm Tiru. I'll present updates to uh, my TLS profiles for IoT devices. Next slide, please. Uh, we will go over a quick recap and then the updates to the draft and uh, questions and comments. Next slide, please. Uh, just a reminder of this draft. This draft uh, was presented at IDF several times. Uh, this draft proposes to extend MUD to describe TLS interactions. Uh, it offers several benefits. Some of the ones are listed uh, in slides. Uh, the first one is to uh, is the ability to define uh, TLS profiles for IoT devices that have uh, diverse communication patterns. Uh, it ha it's useful for IoT devices that uh, learn new skills and frequently change their communication patterns. It's also uh, helpful for uh, identifying uh, um, MITM attacks, especially for IoT devices which have uh, vulnerable uh, SSL implementation, for instance, uh, uh, identifying uh, uh, inadequacies in uh, certificate validation. Next slide, please. <laughs> so what we have done uh, to uh, validate what we are proposing is we have profiled several IoT devices, basically the home network IoT devices. Uh, what we mo observed was that uh, the TLS profiles for IoT devices for benign flows was quite different from the TLS uh, profiles for thousands of malware flows that we got from our uh, uh, research lab. And uh, the conclusion is uh, uh, malicious uh, DTLS use can be uh, successfully identified and blocked. And, and one of the most interesting one was the TLS profiles for IoT devices, even based on type, manufacturer, and model are quite different. Next slide, please. Uh, the updates we have done in the last couple of revisions is to highlight the growing trend of malware using TLS, uh, and to also discuss the implications of TLS 1.3, uh, which encrypts most of the handshake, but still allows inspection of several parameters, uh, for instance, cipher suits and extensions. Uh, supported versions, named groups, and signature algorithms. Even the uh, selected cipher suit uh, uh, in the server hello message can be uh, inspected by middle boxes like firewall or IPS. Uh, what we identified was several malware could be detected even for TLS 1.3, uh, even without acting as a TLS proxy. Uh, for instance, uh, we were able to successfully identify malware which was using uh, cipher suit randomization in uh, client hello messages. Next slide, please. Uh, we also updated the draft to uh, discuss the scenario where uh, a firewall or IPS needs to have, act as a uh, TLS proxy to do a full uh, handshake inspection. Uh, and uh, the section, this uh, section has been uh, updated to reflect that 
the middle box has to follow the behavior defined in uh, TLS 1.3 specification. Uh, uh, TLS proxy may not be viable option in several uh, networks, but could be an viable option in IT managed uh, uh, for IT managed IoT devices. Uh, the advantage of this proposed mechanism is that there is no need for the middle box to inspect the payload, and the middle box can be configured to uh, uh, skip. Uh, connections destined to specific services uh, uh, due to privacy compliance requirements. Uh, as far as the analysis goes, what we identified that uh, uh, malware agents, uh, it, it's quite impossible for malware agents to mimic the behavior of thousands of unique TLS profiles that we seen from IoT devices, and uh, it, it's, it's going to be nearly impossible for them to keep up with the updates to the TLS profiles. Next slide, please. Uh, to address the comments from working group, we updated the young model to define the cl uh, client TLS profiles once and reuse it. For instance, uh, the TLS profile can be defined for a specific destination. For example, uh, IoT device reaching a firmware of server which is using a private CA. So that way, uh, if uh, uh, the IoT device is using a CA for specific destinations, that can be uh, 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 defined in the client TLS profile. Next slide, please. Uh, we would like more feedback on this draft and we would like to collaborate on profiling malware and pain and flows from IoT devices and uh, would request for a working group adoption of the draft. Comments? Ah, uh, general. Um, right now, I, I want to know what's the uh, security considerations on the mod i mean the rfc um 8520 uh, is that enough and i i think that will help you uh describe the motivation on this work yes uh we are referring uh, uh mud as a, as a base young model and extending on that uh, uh, MUD definitely helps to identify uh, and uh, define the intended behavior for devices which are headless and have specific communication. But when it comes to devices which have broad communication patterns, uh, MUD is not uh, that helpful. So this draft comes in play and is useful for such kind of IoT devices. Does MUD provide any um, security mechanisms itself? Um, yeah. The MUD profile itself will be provided by the uh, MUD TLS will be provided by the manufacturer itself, just like the MUD uh, uh, specification that was previously defined. Any other comments? Has been a discussion on your draft on the list, and and I know that Michael's going to present a, a few mud related works um it might be interesting to see how we want as a working group want to progress all of the the next level of mud work um uh, and maybe the ad overall will have some comments on, on what we want to do with mud in general but um i i think like you said you presented this a number of times it would be good to see what the the, the working group is if we if we want to start progressing some of this um, in addition sure. to the base mud spec. Okay, so it's worth the uh, I'll take it to do to to bring it up on the list. Um, what we want to do as a working group around some of this work. So thank you very much, Drew. Hey, hey Drew, Thanks. just can I ask a clarifying question for Tianren? Hey. I'm not sure that I, I quite is that Elliot? Is that you? Yes. This is Elliot, sorry. I, I'm not sure I quite understood Tianrin's um, point. Is it, was it the, in relation to this draft, Tianrin, was it, you wanted to know if the, the security considerations of RC 8520 are sufficient for this draft or, the, or that this draft outstretches those security considerations? Do, do you want to comment more? Because I, I think your point got missed. And I just would like to understand it a little bit. I mean, uh, I mean, in mod draft, I believe you you have already um, uh, you uh, there are some uh, security uh, considerations in that RFC, right? So is that uh, um, uh, is it provide uh, the already provide the security mechanism, or it's just uh, describe the the issues and uh, 
describe describe the requirement and and this draft right now provides the uh, actually the security uh, mechanism. Oh, I I I think and and um, perhaps Tiru can correct me if I'm wrong. I think this draft relies on the mechanisms and security uh, aspects of the underlying MUD mechanisms. Um, which are, uh, you know, can be secure or or less secure, you know, depending on how you derive the the URL, for instance. Um, but I don't think this one introduces new security mechanisms to secure MUD. If that's the question you're asking. Right. Yeah, this draft does not define any new uh, mechanisms mechanisms for uh, discovering the URL. Okay. You. Let's bring up Michael. Michael, can you hear us? Can. Thank you. So That's fifteen right. minutes. Yep, uh, gonna do it. All you take it away, right. Michael so, Richardson. So um. One of the issues uh, going forward is how we get the security um, for the URLs the devices uh, provide. Next slide. So um, one of the questions is why do you need to update the MUD URLs at all at any time? And there's uh, one, one way to do it is you just update the MUD file in place. And another way is that you have the device when it's updated in some way um, provide a new URL. And there's some trade-offs and the document goes into a, a fair bit about the difference. Um, and one of the places where it turns out it's it's a better idea to replace the URL when you update the firmware is when you are using TLS profiles, um, is my opinion. And the reason is that if what you've done is you've, you've changed your TLS libraries, then the profile is likely to be a bit different, um, particularly if you fix some bugs. And so you would like to go forward with your, the profile. But if you change the profile, you are going to, in the file, you're going to make possibly make all the existing devices that have not yet upgraded um, invalid. Um, and this is a, a problem. So the question is, if I want to update the MUD URLs, how do I do that? Next slide. So normally the MUD URL, next slide. comes through DHCP, next slide, or LLDP, and it gets to the MUD manager and the MUD manager goes and retrieves it. Um, there's a third where next slide, which is that it can come through an IDEV ID, for instance, through Brewski, or there's maybe some other ways that you can use an IDEV ID to get a, a MUD URL. And that's considered to be the most secure mechanism because the manufacturer has actually signed the IDEV ID. You actually can trust that um, this, device and the, and the device has proved that it has the private key to the IDEV ID. So it actually has a very strong relationship to the MUD URL and the manufacturer. Next slide. So, but a malicious device with malware could put a different URL in the MUD or the LLDP. Next slide. And so it could in fact say, here's a malicious MUD file that lets me attack Facebook or its favorite target and could, do, could basically uh, make MUD useless. And so that's the problem is, how do I be sure that the MUD URL that I've been given is in fact legitimate MUD URL? Next slide. So the shape of the solution is that the first time you get the MUD URL, either by IDEV ID, or you might do uh, trust on first use for the DHCP LLDP and you get it. And next slide. Get it that way, you got it securely. Uh, next slide, sorry. Next slide. And so then we get the MUD URL the second time through DHCP. Um, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I have too many animations, sorry. So then the restriction is that you can actually update the URL, but you'll notice it has to come from the same location, okay? So um, that means that at, at most you could have a, a manufacturer, let's say LG, 
could refrigerators could pretend to be their toasters. Um, is that a huge issue? Well, it might or may not be, depending on exactly how you organize it. Next slide. So um, people have asked, well, if the IDF ID is more secure, why don't you just update that? And, and then you have no problem. And the answer is because you don't generally go through a, an onboarding process again after the device is onboarding. So you aren't going to use the IDF ID again. And in many cases, you can't update the IDF ID. It's, it's in a, some kind of a, a TPM or other secure storage. And you really couldn't update it without effect, effectively doing a factory recall of a product. Um, and if you could update the IDEV ID, then maybe the malware could update it. And that may be a concern as well. Next slide. So there's two ideas. One is that we update 8520 to essentially do a semantic change that says that the URL uh, it, that you specified in it, the base that's inside the MUD file, in fact, tells you where updates have to come from. So that would be a semantic change to something that's already there. The second idea is that we add an extension to essentially provide a base URL. Next slide. And so then that's the question, what to do next. Questions? Or I could take them at the end if you prefer, Joe. Um, I don't see anyone in the, uh, in the queue, so why don't we keep uh, going? If there are any, I'll give a second if there are any questions. Let's uh, go on. What are we doing next? The next wanted. one is. Um, next one is IOT going to be. Hi, Joe. Hello, to you in the queue. Oh, sorry, uh, Elliot is in the queue. Elliot. Yes. Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Michael, for this draft and and. Uh, I think it, it it represents a good start. The the key thing I, I think we want to think about is um, how might we uh, protect against various downgrade attacks? Um, so could we, for instance, have the original MUD URL have a forward pointer as to authorize MUD URLs? Um, and so, uh, or could the original MUD file have a, have, have a a forward pointer to uh, valid MUD URLs for a particular device type uh, based on, let's say, versioning information or some such. Yeah, so so my proposal is that essentially that is that that's option two, is that you have a thing that says all future profiles must be prefixed by this URL, which lets you put a firmware version at the end. And, and that's really it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this next next uh, uh, thing is peripherally about MUD, but it's also about IoT and, and the great DNS over HTTPS and stuff. Next slide, please. So typical in a MUD file is that you will provide an access control list that allows a particular device. I have used Elliot's classic uh, photocopier uh, printer that we are suspicious about. Um, to access some service in the cloud, and uh, I missed my air quotes, and the MUD manager will typically look up that uh, that service by name, will get an IP address, and install an access control list. Next slide. So, okay, so it gets more complicated. Um, the service is now in an, a content distribution network, and so you're going to do a, a MUD manager, you're going to resolve something uh, in the content distribution network. And if everything works well, you're going to have install an access control list to there. So far, everything is, is fine. Um, it doesn't look too much different. Next slide, please. So now the device manufacturers decide that they don't really trust the local DNS and they're going to use some uh, cloud-based DNS, whether it's DNS over you know, quad A, quad X, or DNS over TLS, or DNS over HTTPS. It doesn't really matter exactly. What matters is that they're going to ask an external entity about this. Next slide, please. So next slide, please. Double in animation. So it gets back an answer. You notice it says 0, uh, 02, 1, 2, 3, 4. You notice that's not the same answer the MUD manager got, which was 01, uh, 78AB. 
Next slide, please. So the connection that was authorized was to that that near server because that's the geographically closest device to the MUD manager. But the connection that the device makes, next slide, please, is some other place, which the MUD manager is like, oh, I don't know, I've never heard of this place. And it probably gets denied. So that's the fundamental problem that we're trying to deal with is to make sure that this is not going to be a problem in going forward. Next slide, please. So there's some other problems that are related to this that show up, okay, um, where essentially the MUD manager is unable to see what the traffic actually was, and they're kind of related, and so I can clump them in the same place. One is if you have IP address literals and protocol, okay, um, go back to FTP. Right, but typically that's the same location. Um, it's not unusual to have um, uh, some kind of protocol where the device asks the cloud, "Am I running the right piece of software?" And if the cloud says no, then the cloud gives it a URL to go get the right piece of software. And if that URL that it gives it is not in the mud file, because it, that was the whole point of asking the cloud is they could now position it wherever they wanted to uh, use whatever cloud resources they needed to make the upgrade work and then pass out whatever URLs they wanted. Well, that's not in the mud file and therefore that off that access is not going to be authorized. Um, and another example is they have done that, but now they've specified, for instance, they may have said, well, uh, uh, Amazon S3 buckets temp typically have all the same name. So you said, I'm going to an Amazon S3 bucket. Well, now you can go to any, any S3 bucket at all. Next slide, please. So this document is about advice, essentially. Don't do this, all right? Here's a list of things you shouldn't do, okay? In particular, um, you should always use names within your own, own scope so that you always have control in them. Um, you should always use DNS um, that's provided by the local DNS server so that you get the same geographic view of the rest of the thing. And if you are going to have um, uh, uh, some kind of content distribution network, then make sure that it answers with a round robin DNS type of things. I think that's on the next slide. Always answer with all of the quad A and A records that you're going to use. And th there's like the old way of doing this is with round robin was that they would just always uh, rotate it such that the first IP address that is the one they want you to use, they would actually give you all the, the client, all the rest of the IP addresses uh, so that it could use them afterwards if it wanted to. Um, I actually looked to figure out whether there was some BCP or some other document that explained how to do this. And it goes back and I didn't really find a lot of ITF advice. And maybe there's some advice elsewhere on how to do this. But if you look up Google, for instance, or Facebook, they don't give you all the IP addresses for those. They give you a few. and um, and you're expected to use that one. And if you happen to come across or have cached a different one, tough, right? So that's a big deal. And this is some advice that I think that we need to give to manufacturers such that when they are setting up their devices to use MUD, they pick the right thing. Next slide, please. And that's it. And so it's a BCP. Don't really have a lot of, of protocol parts. Um, it would be more examples would be good. Apparently, the DNS people don't like the term quad X uh, and didn't standardize it. So they don't know what we're going to call that. Questions? Uh, Elliot. Hey, thanks for this draft, Michael. Um, I think it's pretty important. And actually, um, just by way of how important it is, um, there's work going on at ICANN um, in the FSAC. I think Jacques is actually tied into that, by the way. Okay. Um, uh, that is looking at DNS for IoT. So a couple of points to make. The first of which is, um, I really believe that this is not fundamental to MUD, but is fundamental to IoT. Um, that is to say, it's bigger than MUD, um, the problem that you're hitting on. Um, because uh, even if you manually try to configure, access list without any MUD involved at all, you can still run into this problem if you, know, you cannot specify the, the if, you, if you have no way to learn the mapping. The fundamental issue here is that the policy enforcement point for whether to decide whether to pass a packet or not is the 
term, not well bound um, to the game resolution mechanism. Um, now, going back to one of the points that you've made, which is use the DHCP provided DNS server. Um, in my opinion, um, I think that's good short term advice. I'm not sure it's the right long term approach. And so some of the other work that's going on in the IETF that has interested me along these lines and should interest you even more, Michael, is um, that uh, somebody has gone to the effort to parameterize uh, in Yang all the DHCP options. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yes. Now, what can you do with that? Right? One of the things you can do with that is you can provide those DHCP options over a secure transport. As in, in at, when you're enrolling or after you're enrolling. And I'll lead you to think about that for just a little bit. Um, but so, so I would say this is a, an interesting work. I think it should become a DCP at some point. Um, and it could even, we could even adopt it now, but I think it needs a little bit of work in terms of the advice being given. So Tiro um, and some other people uh, have been basically trying to make sure that um, it's possible to do DNS over TLS or DNS over HTTPS uh, with the DHCP ser with the ser DNS servers that DHCP told you about, um, and I think that that is very much needs to be what IoT devices do. Whether that's appropriate for your tablet, I would, may have a different, completely different view of that. But that's that's my view is that that IoT devices having no user interface need to use the local DNS. And uh, because that's the only way that the local operator gets control over uh, or can protect them if they really want to do DNS firewalls. Um, and, and therefore, it's inappropriate for the devices to talk to the, to the cloud for their DNS uh, ever. Um, and it, I think that would, I think if the document said only that, that may be very controversial, but at least um, you'd be able to ask vendors, are you compliant RFC, blah, blah, blah. And they would say yes or no. You would know that up front. Um, as for the comment about DHCP uh, Yang options, that's an interesting way to to make DHCP more more secure, and that's interesting. And I think Tiro has been looking at that too. So I know Tiro's had his hand up too. Tiro. So. Here's Tiro. Sorry, I was on mute. Hey, hey, Michael, thanks for the draft. And uh, I agree with most of the uh, proposals that you have in draft. So what we have been doing is we are using uh, domain names for doing DNS filtering for IoT devices for enforcing word. So that seemed like a, 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 a like the right technique, especially because of CDNs and uh, geolocation and geo proximity issues that you could get different IP addresses. The other one is uh, uh, Using IoT, uh, not just for MUD, but I think IoT devices need to move to using uh, DOT or DOH, uh, not just for policy enforcement, but also for security and privacy reasons. Like you don't want people to see what DNS queries that IoT devices is making because uh, uh, we have seen many IoT devices making DNS queries and you can pretty much figure out what that device is doing. So privacy is a very important aspect for IoT devices and uh, you don't want somebody to know whether uh, you're talking to your Alexa and giving it commands. So, just looking at DNS traffic, it's pretty easy to do pervasive monitoring. So I think the bigger question for IoT devices is to discover and use uh, network provided uh, DOT DOH servers and uh, home networks and ISPs should uh, start migrating to that and uh, that way they get both uh, security and privacy. Completely. So uh, as I said, I'll do a, a call out to the uh, working group around all the mud work and michael you have one more and if you could uh, expedite that would be fantastic i will go as quickly as possible how fast can you hit the down arrow uh fast down all you next uh so um device goes into quarantine because it violates its mud its mud uh, uh process next slide Um, during that quarantine, it needs to access uh, the uh, its updates. Okay, um, and the device can't upsite, update itself. It 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 may have to be connected to uh, critical things, um, and so 
while it's in quarantine because it's been it's behaved poorly, we don't know exactly why yet. It may still need some network access. In particular, at the minimum, it may need network access to the update server in order to be able to get the update. Um, if it's some other critical device, and we're thinking like you know ventilators, um, then maybe it needs access to the status console to update the fact that it's still running, it's still working. Although maybe it's done something that was maybe a bit wrong. Um, in particular, early on in the mud lifetime or life cycle, um, vendors are going to get mud. Um, they're going to get things wrong. They're going to not know exactly what they do, and they're going to trip over and be quarantined unintentionally. Um, and so we need to be able to basically uh, continue on um, in some uh, reduced uh, uh, access profile. And this essentially says which this marks which access control lists, which ACLs are to be enabled during quarantine and which ones are not. That's it. End. Next slide. There's an example. Next slide. Next slide. I think that's it. Hitting down. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Questions? Not a new document. It's been around for at least a year. Hasn't changed much. There's not a lot to say, I don't think, in it. Uh, security extensions are very long. Hey, Michael, uh, I mean, this thanks. seems, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the draft again. I mean, this seems uh, obvious and the right thing to do. I was wondering, I mean, why not let the device do its internet activity in addition to the firmware updates? Because, uh, for example, for a home use case, right, you don't want the device to stop completely functioning till the firmware upgrade happens. Yeah, I'm not saying it's only for firmware upgrading. I'm saying okay. you can mark any ACL as being essentially critical. And so, you know, if the device needs to do something specific, you can significantly reduce its functionality when it's when it's been tripped. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And next we have got Andrew. Can you hear us? Yes. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We can. You're coming through loud and clear. Uh, Andrew Gray, all yours. Perfect. And uh, I will expedite this as best I can. Uh, so this is sampled streaming. We presented this at the last IETF. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just as a quick refresher, the problem we're trying to solve is essentially we as a uh, service provider, we're seeing all these platforms with insanely high throughputs coming down the line. We have a number of devices presently that do various traffic captures and what have you. However, uh, various vendors and what have you are informing us it's going to be a struggle to maintain sampling rates and what have you. Um, that are going to be acceptable for our general use case. So what this draft is trying to do is make it so we can actually just have the forwarding ASICs on the boxes themselves, do the uh, sampling and sending the packets off box in a format that is extremely convenient to, that, to those forwarding ASICs because I can throw a ton of x86 compute or whatever I wanna to do to this traffic flow once I get it out of the box. In addition, that forwarding A6 certainly has additional information, you know, exact times of when the packets came in, especially if we combine this with PTP, which is something we're experimenting with, uh, you know, getting very precise um, data as to when the packets started coming in an ASIC and when it was starting to leave, that sort of thing. Um, let's actually skip all the way down to changes from O2, which is slide eight. We'll skip the rest of those. Yep. Um, so after the uh, uh, presentation in Singapore, we did have another follow-up meeting, which was, uh, we got a lot of good input on that. We have done a few updates. Uh, we are using the Ops AWG GitLab or uh, GitHub for this work, so you can find it up on there. There were some questions about what interfaces are available or subject. Uh, some people mentioned there's a pretty good use case for doing subscriber interfaces. After talking about this, um, it's listed in the draft as an explicit option, but unfortunately it must be a may because again, every hardware, every platform is going to be operating differently. So we didn't wanna require that in there. And that might be probably should be a should, 
but uh, that's one of the things that we're pondering about. Um, there was a lot of questions about how this is different than PSAMP, uh, or the, and, uh, this draft focuses primarily on getting the, met, the metadata extraction out of there with a negotiated uh, packet header and packet format that comes off the forwarding ASIC. And its primary driving focus is to keep the control plane of any specific router completely out of the packet flow and make it so the ASIC can do it just as quick and as uh, simply as it possibly can. Uh, there was a request to clarify the order of sampling requests, basically how do they get actually installed um, in terms of do ACLs uh, occur before or after. Uh, this one we ended up having to split a little bit because there is an option inside sample streaming for please sample the packets that you would normally discard, which has a number of interesting uh, use cases that uh, have been talked about basically verifying things like ACLs are working or, you know, QoS filter or QoS rate sampling is working, that sort of thing. So uh, the draft has clarified that if there is um, sampling requested to drop packets, it must occur before any other sampling. And if there is no such matching, it has to occur after the uh, sampling, which seems to be the best compromise, but more than willing to take any additional feedback on that one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, request from the working group. Uh, the O3 draft did get posted. However, uh, we really could use uh, help or a co-author or somebody to come in and help with some of the Yang model work. Uh, we did have some feedback to bring in PSAMP and some of the other um, uh, work that's already been done for models. There is a, a little bit of overlap. We made a crack at it. Um, it's not great as of 03, uh, so fully intending an 04, but certainly wouldn't mind having another or a few extra sets of eyes on uh, specifically the Yang model in particular, and if any other people want to have uh, any other kind of feedback about the draft in its entirety. And that is actually it for me. Any questions? Uh, we, Michael Richardson is in queue. Okay. Hi, um, so this is sort of fortuitous um, in the sense that um, one of the piece of work that's not on our agenda this time is to restart the PCAP NG work. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to say that maybe there's some um, good um, synergies here between this document and PCAP NG. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that I can imagine it, some of which may be um, uh, not necessarily changing your wire format either. Thanks. Yeah, so this uh, draft is actually one of the tricks to it is a pretty it's a dynamic wire format because it allow it's done that way to allow the box that is actually sending the traffic to say, hey, you know, this you know my forwarding ASIC or whatever has this little bit of metadata, you know, these 10 bits or 12 bits or four bytes or whatever it ends up being in the header, I can send that off to you. Here's the format. The the encoding of that um, or the uh, how that format is described is actually flexible enough that you can actually, uh, I think I actually have it in their draft as an example, uh, say here's PCAP NG's form or PCAP's format. You know, uh, and just I actually hand thinking that off. about the other way. PCAP NG could actually uh, standardize all of the different uh, uh, captures from the different ASICs that you may imagine as well. So you could write it to a file in that format and have it stamped as being that format in oh. Wireshark. Then o open it natively for coming from where it's coming from your chip. That's actually yeah. That's actually okay. Yeah, I'll have to take a look at it. Uh, we've been using a variety of little shell-based tools to try and uh, tinker with this here locally. But yeah, that would be, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Okay, I'll take a look. Um, I kind of have this similar question uh, and suggestion as Michael. And uh, I think eventually you want to export the raw packet with some metadata. So uh, why not uh, extend some existing protocols like uh, IPFIX uh, as the uh, exporting channel, or uh, I see some uh, existing um, spam protocols like uh, uh, YARSPAN and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so again, the, the because the primary reason behind this is this is intended for a forwarding ASIC to do. We need to be able to allow it to be as simple or as relatively complex as those ASICs can handle, you know, the newest ASICs from Cisco or whoever else can do some fairly complicated things. Uh, you know, if we're talking lower end hardware, you know, you may just get the raw packet and ba basically nothing else, no metadata at all. So having the flexibility to be able to carry that metadata and get it off the box, it is intended that this gets sent to a collector box that takes that metadata, then hashes it or, and, well, hash is a bad word, um, then uh, reworks it into another format then to be sent on or be a collector in and of itself. So this is just to get it off, off the box as quick and easily as possible without needing to involve the control plane, without needing to involve any additional overhead on the box. I did not really implement all these protocols, but it seems uh, the IP fix could be implemented also in um, ASIC or, or hardware. And, uh, and I see the spam protocol is to monitor the, uh, the to mirror the, the interface. So it should be very fast. I think uh, it could work for this requirement. I think so. Um, yeah, so we we talk about this a little bit in the draft as to why it's not a great fit. In terms of R-SPAN and ER-SPAN, those are also fixed protocols, so we may be able to get the data we want. We may not be able to get the data off. It may have to involve a variety of packet reordering and rewriting of headers and what have you, which is all of which we're trying to avoid. Um, it, it, that, that that's kind of the the root of this. I'll take another look at the R span and the R span stuff and see if there's a way to do it. But having the ability to specify the packet format coming off the box is kind of the key bit to this. Um, so anything that tries to put wrappers around that is going to be against what we're trying to do and, and potentially makes it so less capable ASICs cannot do it. And that's the other part of this is, yes, top tier ASICs can do a lot of really amazing things with uh, the packets going out of them, but we don't have those everywhere, in our, uh, at least in our network, and uh, can't really afford that. Um, so we need something that even the most basic ASIC could go, hey, you know, I, I can only give you, you know, eight bits to tell you what port it came in, but at least here's the packet. Um, and that's all I can do. Okay. And that's the main concern with those. So I have a chair question, but I'll let Frank jump jump ahead of me. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Well, first, uh, one quick one, and I, I I think I asked that question in somewhat in a similar format in, in 106, and I also sent a note to the email list. Um, this is the same vein of what we heard so far, uh, Andrew, and I think it would make sense to include an IP fix example. So you have suggested packet formats in section four. And mm -hmm. It would be, I think, useful for all the IP fix minded audience to then give a similar example with reference to IP fix defined fields. And uh, because the delta between what you have in the example and what you could go and do with uh, standard IP fix fields is relatively small. And I think that's also what, what Jenner was, was uh, hinting at. So I think that example would help everybody understand things much more than rather than raising the, the obvious question over and over again. So I think that little section would probably help readability and understanding much more than okay. coming back to that argument and that question all the time. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll make a note to put that in there. And then the other part that came out of that same conversation, I think you and I had at uh, Singapore about pulling in some of the IP fix fields for doing the, uh, on the uh, negotiation to say, hey, you know, here's the different formats and whatever. We did pull some of that into the Yang models. That's also part of the other thing. We kind of need to go back through the Yang models to uh, clean that up a little bit for an 04 draft. All right. Andrew, uh, real quick, is your, I haven't looked at the, the late, latest model, is it in a place where you wouldn't mind a expert Yang doctor review, or are you really just looking for a co-author to really shore it up first? 
Uh, I think actually we're uh, we're kind of in a almost an almost state with a Yang doctor. Um, I think. Uh, um, I. I uh, let me get an 04 kicked out first before the Yang Doctor uh, review, just because there are a few things in there that I do want to have enough time to go back through. But I think at that point, yeah, having a uh, Yang Doctor review would be very beneficial because a lot of this is wrapped up in the Yang model and uh, most of it is in pretty good shape. There's just one or two rough points I, I, that I know about that I want to clean up before we uh, do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving right along, we have uh, how you. Can you hear us? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Take okay. it away. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, uh, since uh, ITF 106, uh, we start the uh, adoption call for this uh, draft. Uh, and we received a lot of comments, uh, suggestions, and critics from uh, numerous reviewers. Uh, we'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Frank, uh, Al, uh, Alan, Warren, Alex, and uh, Daniel. Um, maybe we missed some names here. Um, uh, based on their feedbacks, we uh, have uh, uh, updates uh, this draft uh, for multiple versions. Now it's uh, already uh, dash 11. And uh, in these revisions, we made some significant uh, significant modifications on the content. And first, we clarified the scope and uh, uh, also the relationship of this document with some other documents. And uh, we just highlight high-level framework and remove uh, many of the unnecessary terms uh, to keep it abstract. And also, we modify the framework by removing the encapsulation and the tunneling module uh, from the uh, from the framework itself, because we think that's more on the uh, interface and the standard side, not the uh, one integral part of the framework itself. And we also add a lot of block diagrams and detailed des descriptions for uh, each existing uh, framework module. And uh, we enhance the standard status and the gap analysis. And then finally, we also update the style of the writing uh, to remove uh, some of the marketing uh, sound terms. Next. Uh, next, I can see the slides update. Okay. Uh, so first of all, we uh, consider uh, the focus of this uh, framework is actually on a special uh, type of uh, uh, data plane telemetry technologies. Uh, we categorize that as a, a hybrid type of the data plane OAM. And further, we can partition this hybrid type to two subtypes. Uh, one of the, them is named passport type, another is a postcard type. We already seen a lot of examples, um, example techniques uh, in ATF uh, for each of these subtypes. So next slide. So uh, okay. Uh, so based on how we will uh, apply this this type of techniques on the um, uh, uh, networks, especially for the carrier uh, networks, uh, we come up with, with this uh, uh, abstract um, framework, and now it contain uh, contains four uh, key components. Uh, covering the uh, technique selection and the flow package selection and data selection and how we will output the pro uh, data and how we will generate the data. So for each uh, components, we provide a detailed description and what the, what the uh, uh, modules we can be uh, used to contribute uh, to that uh, specific components. Next slide. So why we have this document? So because this is the only document, now we cover a new type of uh, data plane telemetry techniques from the high level view. <laughs> and uh, we also put it in the perspective of the entire network telemetry framework. And uh, in this document, we summarize some key deployment requirements and challenges, uh, especially in carrier networks. 
And this high-level architecture uh, framework also aim to address some of the key challenges. And it helped to identify gaps and uh, give the directions for related standard development. But uh, in this document, we will not cover any standardization of underlying techniques and interfaces uh, that will be covered by the individual, um, individual drafts. Next slide. So to, to summarize, the uh, main contribution of this uh, draft is uh, we first summarize and clar clarify a new type of uh, techniques and provide the challenges and requirements for deployment. We give a high level framework and the application example. And finally, we give the standard status and gap analysis. So uh, we'd like to ask all our uh, reviewers to give a, another round of review of this document and provide us the feedback. Uh, to see if your uh, questions or has been answered or if you have uh, any other concerns or suggestions to keep improving this document. And based on the feedback, we'd like to uh, ask for the uh, working group adoption for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Frank, I see you in the queue. Frank Brockners. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks for the update and uh, I appreciate the effort to actually Try to reflect some of the, the comments that we we gave you. Um, unfortunately, I think I have to say that I'm not sure whether we're moving forward or we are rather moving backwards on the document. Because uh, I think still a lot of the, the issues that we identified are still there, right? So you still have a lot of terms that you define, and um, these terms are unclear of what to do with them. So um, I think you went from IFID head notes to now head notes, and you went from IFID end notes to end notes, but those are still undefined. You had IFID nodes, now they're called capable nodes. You still don't know what a capable node is, right? And you still have Huawei marketing language in there, like IFID even as the name. Um, you have um, things like slow, uh, smart flow, telemetry or smart data export, even at that on the earlier slide, I think it was slide, slide three. So I think many of the comments that we gave are not even reflected so far. So not sure whether we're actually making progress on the document. Yeah, I, I would see uh, some of the terms like the hat node and end node, I think it's easy to uh, understand um, because I said, just use to describe uh, what's in the scope of this uh, uh, um, uh, FIT-based network. And uh, so I, I can add some more descriptions on that, but I don't think uh, it will make it more clearer because I think it's uh, basically easy to understand. And uh, for some other terms, I, uh, I can um, maybe, yeah, we can think of uh, to, uh, Modify the uh, how we call that, and uh, we can use some more uh, neutral terms. But uh, yeah, I, I think that that's 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 doable. Jean uh, Ben Lee. Uh, okay, I have a question for the Frank. Why do you think uh, I think it belong to Huawei? from our point of view, because this is the inflow, this is the monitoring. I think we need a framework name, but we, at the beginning, we do not have this the appropriate name so that we use the effort. But when we, that's the proposal that we reuse the name in the Huawei's solution, but I don't think the effort is the Huawei's private name because this is a technical terminology. And let's call it something else, right? Give it a new name. So that, that resolves the, the overall confusion, right? So either call it Huawei SciFit and make it. Uh, I think this is just have it, a, have it a different name. I think that that's I think that's the problem that you have throughout the document. You're you're starting to redefine a load of terminology that is already defined in other places. And I can give you more examples on that, but I think. 
let's take that off to the list. I think that's much easier. No, uh, Frank, Frank, yeah, I'd like to clarify. There's no, we, we try to highlight a new type of techniques. There's new ter no terms for this. That's why we come up with this term. We, it's very clear to show in the first slides how we categorize this technique and uh, give it a name. And uh, if, if we have a new framework, we have to give it a name. So that, that's neutral. Well, I would disagree, right? IFIT supports two basic on-path telemetry modes. Passport mode, yes. which is direct reference to IOAM tracing. And another mode that is called postcard mode, which is reference to a now deferred and no longer for, uh, for an, uh, an evolved document in IPPM, which is the same functionality as IOM direct export. So I think why do we need to go and even redefine a new name for what you call on path no, no. telemetry? We have a name for that. It's in, in situ OEM. I think it's well established. So I'm not understanding why we need to go and define a raft of new technology, no, uh, terminology yeah. that confuses so, everybody without adding any value. So think of yeah, that. I, I, I don't think uh, there's a confusion. If you look at the slides, says, yeah, there's some uh, IOM uh, techniques covered by these two type of uh, uh, subtypes, but there are also other type of techniques. It's all on the data plane of the telemetry, and uh, there's no name to cover that. And besides, that's the on pass telemetry is the name of the technique itself, but uh, IFIT is the name of the framework. It's a difference. I would agree yeah, with not taking this to the list. We're, we're not going to solve this here. Um, and we, we, we do need to move on. And I, I agree that taking this conversation to the list is probably the best thing. There's clearly some uh, issues to sort out in all of this. Uh, Tian Ren, anything quickly? Yes, no? Tian Ren? Um, I think we need to uh, firstly agree on the scope in the mailing list. And here I would like to add uh, some um, clarification about this work. It seems it's not just uh, a classification of the uh, the data plan technologies. It's a, a more about a high level framework for how to orchestrate uh, different technologies. Okay. Again, let's take the conversation there. To, we're not going to solve this on this point on this call. Um, and while I notice you're here, um, you asked me if I could present, but you're here. Do you want to present this? Okay, so I'm mute. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, uh, Benoit has asked me to uh, present on his behalf. Um, I hope you feel better soon, Benoit. Uh, this was presented services. Oh. The uh, service assurance for uh, intent based networking was presented at uh, IETF 106. Um, this is an update. Just as a summary, the, uh, in the purpose of this work is to be able to say that given a service, uh, let's say a, a VPN service, uh, confirm that, okay, it may be configured, but is it operating correctly? And when it's not operating correctly, can we identify where in the um, service hierarchy and the whole end-to-end -end service that problem is happening? The idea here being is uh, it says closed loop automation on the slide. The point is it's a way of saying if I'm going to be monitoring something and I need to make quick corrective changes to the network based on what I'm monitoring, can I do that? Can I have enough atomic insight into what's happening with the service? to be able to make those changes. The goal of this work is to provide that, to provide a way of decomposing a complex service into these smaller parts so that we can measure their health. And we can say this part of the service, or what we call a subservice, 
is uh, working correctly or not. And then we can uh, float that or surface that up so that we're able to make decisions based on that. Look at the overall health of the service, decide if it's degraded or not, and then drill in to figure out where um, where the, the, the root cause might be. Ultimately, this is a complement to end-to-end uh, -end synthetic testing, um, like being able to do probes over top of a service to ensure that it is, is functioning correctly. This uh, complements that to be able to, again, uh, figure out where in that service graph um, there might be a problem. So here's a graphical in, uh, depiction of that. You might have a tunnel, the thing that you, you sell, the thing that you care about, um, and that gets decomposed, or there's instances of that. So you might have n number of customers doing it with that generic quote unquote tunnel service. Um, there's multiple instances, and within each of those instances, there are multiple subservices that um, independently need to be monitored and also need to, uh, they have relations uh, with themselves. So we need to understand how the subservices relate to each other so that we can understand from a cascade standpoint uh, where something is failing and what impact that could have to uh, other parts of the uh, of the service as a whole or other parts of the either the service instance or the service as a whole so we have from the bottom up we have these impacting uh, dependencies and we might also have informational dependencies uh, with things that are related to the service but not directly uh, in the critical path. Like, for example, ECMP, uh, we could lose a leg, for example, and still have the service operating correctly, but it still might be degraded because that service is uh, not as redundant or, or not as highly available as it could be. So, uh, what we want to know when a service degrades, what is the root cause, what is that subservice that is uh, having the problem, and what is, if that one subservice could be shared across multiple instances, so what is the overall impact uh, to the network or to what were the services that we're offering as a whole. The definition here, and uh, this is Benoit has uh, running and working code, working with some operators as well on this. Uh, the architecture defined is, is both flexible and limited in scope. So what uh, this work defines is gang interfaces between some of these components, uh, how the internals of these components are architected, um, deployed, those are implementation. Those are uh, explicitly left out of scope, but the scope is how do we convey uh, the service kind of definition, how we break down the subservices, uh, that part is also extensible, and then the kind of the information we're getting. So you can see this is the architecture. There's questions that could be answered based on how one wants to implement this. So some of these things might be implemented on box. Some of these things might be implemented distributedly uh, or distributed throughout the network. Um, some of these things could be uh, implemented within the device, within the uh, control management plane of the device itself. Uh, the interfaces are being defined here. That's the, the work that Benoit is uh, put forth uh, as, as Yang models. However, like I mentioned, the um, uh, internal architecture of the SANE Orchestra Service Assurance for Intent-Based Networking, the, the name they've come up with, um, that is out of scope. That is not, that is left to implementation decisions. So you can see some of the, um, the tree that's defined, how they define the dependency relationship between a service and the subservices that require it. Um, and then you see how those things are uh, scored in terms of a, uh, a health score that you can say, okay, either this thing is fully dead, it is degraded, it is um, fully healthy. And so then based on that and weighing that and measuring that across all the subservices, you can determine um, you need to focus what services are truly degraded, where you need to focus your root cause analysis work or that uh, closed loop, where, where your uh, action in that closed loop can, can take effect. In terms of changes between what was presented at 106, there was a, a notion that there needed to be the idea of reflecting a maintenance window. And so uh, they added that. Uh, being a Boolean to say whether or not a service or subservice is under maintenance, um, and then who is the content of that maintenance work. There's also, as I mentioned, the ability to extend the um, 
uh, extend the model, extend the architecture uh, to allow for new subservice types, uh, even vendor specific subservice types that excuse um, additional parameters that need to be uh, specified. So the the model and the uh, the way it's defined allows for that extensibility. Ultimately, and again, I'm presenting by proxy. Um, Benoit wants to know, is this, and he asked this last time, is this a valid problem for the industry to solve? And there was some uh, feedback on the list, uh, suggestions about direction as well as perhaps this is a valid problem. Is it a valid problem to solve at the IETF? And if so, are they going in the right direction? And we can, as I mentioned, since we can't do hums or anything here, uh, we, can, we can take this uh, additional request up on the list. But I do see there are some questions in queue and I think Sue Hare's as the first one. I'll do my best to answer by proxy. It's a simple one. Listed ISIS as a tunnel protocol in your slide. Uh, and I don't know, is that something that's part of the definition or if it's part of the main focus? There is still um, BGP track uh, tag tunnels. Uh, is that something that's going to be part of this as well? So, so this is uh, this is an example of a service, um, and and in this particular instance, their uh, the routing protocol, for example, is ISIS. There, the the underlying uh, routing protocol could be very different from this. Um, in as you decompose a service, you might find that it's BGP or OSPF. Um, this was just an example. To, to say in this particular case, this is a, a graphical depiction of how a service might be broken down into its underlying subservices. So, um, in this graphical example, uh, you gave ISIS as an example, you could give BGP as an example. This is a part of the specification, which is uh, not part of the main, but part of things that could. Uh, be defined. Did I understand what you just said? I, Correct. Uh, it is not part of the spec. It is not part of the specification I I in and of itself. These are types of subservices that are fairly generic. As you can see, you could specify the type of subservice, but there's nothing ISIS specific or BGP specific in here. This is, is designed to be flexible, in my understanding, to accommodate. Uh, whatever the routing protocol might be for a given uh, overall service. Thank you very much. Uh, Warren, I see you in the queue as well. Warren Kumari. Right. Okay, Warren, uh, we can't hear you. Um, so, unless you, in as I move my mouse to end this presentation, you come in. We will move on to our last presentation, which is Joey. Sorry, Warren. Uh, Joey Boyd. Are you able to speak? Can you Let's continue. Joey, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? We yes. can. So, all right. Okay, so this uh, presentation is regarding some new Yang data models for IPFIX, PSAMP, and bulk data export. As mentioned, this has started as an AD sponsored draft, and we'll go through some of the summary of where, where we are and see where we might want to go. So next slide, please. A little intro in the broadband access market, we have requirements for using IP fix for transporting bulk data. Uh, bulk data collection in this sense is an automated collection of data from a device that's packaged together and delivered to an IP fix collector. It, it goes beyond packet sampling. Uh, for example, it can include statistics for interfaces, sub interfaces, uh, commonly performance monitoring, things like that. Uh, there's also requirements uh, for using IP fix in broadband forum for transporting bulk data. Uh, for example, in TR-352 uh, interchannel transport protocol uh, uses IP fix to transport 
uh, dynamic data, for example, lease information across participating NGPON2 systems. Next slide, please. We analyzed the existing IPFIX PSAMP model that was defined in RFC 6728. Uh, we noted that it's a single Yang module that performs PSAMP, uh, PSAMP operations. The collection process from PSAMP and the IPFIX exporting process are all combined in the same module. It only supports a PSAMP meter as some assumptions that the device supports SETP. And so using this model was going to be a little challenging for the other applications, such as the TR352 ICTP. Uh, noted that RFC 5153 requires support for SC SCTP for PSAMP. So the model was written so that there was no specific feature defined for SCTP to make it explicitly optional. Uh, for TR352, it's only support for uh, TCP and TLS. The uh, 6728 model requires PSAMP meter to be configured, even if the observation points are already defined by other Yang models. There are also some other general challenges. The draft has uh, a few more of these spelled out, uh, but one of the, the first ones we noted was interface references are through IFMIB, IF index rather than using IETF interface references, the same on the hardware side, using physical entity indexes instead of using hardware component references. Of course, those didn't exist when this draft was written, so that's understandable. So our conclusion was trying to augment, and in some cases deviate, uh, the existing 6728 model to support uh, not only BBF requirements, but general broadband access requirements uh, was going to be challenging. Uh, so we decided to go down a path of a new Yang model where functionality is separated into different modules so that the functions can be independently leveraged. Next slide, please. So our new model, you know, we're adhering to the general principles defined in 6728 with some, some exceptions. Uh, we went ahead and adopted to conform to the latest RFC 8407 Yang guidelines. For example, identify our naming conventions. And so that makes this not backward compatible with the previous. Uh, there are also other reasons we'll talk about. Uh, we added support for RFC 8343, 8348 for interface and hardware references, respectively. Uh, we broke the model up into three modules. IETF IP fix defines the IP fix collector and exporter functions. IETF PSAMP defines the PSAMP functions for configuring device to sample, meter, a subset of packets from the network. And IETF bulk data export, which defines the bulk data IP fix templates and filtering functions to apply to bulk data. This is outside the, the PSAMP. CCP data nodes that are not made explicitly optional with an SCTP feature. That way, applications not requiring to support SCTP can advertise as such. Uh, IPFIX transport sessions allow the session information to be retrieved individually. Uh, before, it was just a keyless list. Uh, when you have applications such as NGPON2, which may have a large number of transport sessions, being able to pull one individually it is an advantage. Uh, we've done some refactoring and made things like source and destination address types. We made them choice statements so that we can have extensibility uh, in the, of the model as future applications come in. Next slide, please. So the idea once you have this is that applications using this would be expected to only need to use an applicable Yang model. So if you have a PSAMP application, you only need the IP fix and PSAMP modules. If you have bulk data, you need IP fix and bulk data export. For TR352 ICTP, you only need the IETF IP fix module. Next slide, please. So the question we're here asking is, should this move forward? Uh, we've gotten, previously we've gotten through the process far enough that we've had a Yang doctor review uh, with favorable feedback and we've addressed the issues identified. There were other review comments from uh, other ADs and, and those on the last call review and we've addressed those except for, and the reason we're here today is the obsolescence of RFC 6728. Of course, we chose not to augment it to support these new requirements. Uh, new models designed to be flexible. Uh, it's adhering to the latest you know, Yang recommendations, uh, covers piece, existing PSAMP use case, 
as well as new bulk data use cases. And so for this reason, we the new model was recommending obsolution of 6728, but there are other options that I'll talk about in a second. And so should the document move forward in its present state? Uh, if the obsolution path is acceptable, can we continue forward with it? Otherwise, another option would be to rewrite the draft to define the new models as described. And we would only then reference 6728 where applicable, describe the new functionality. And I believe when we were when we were going through this, we found a few places in 6728 where some of the process descriptions were missing some, some information. So we could use this as an opportunity to fill in those gaps. And with that, I'm, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Joey. Uh, so just putting it out, the, 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 one of the reasons that we brought this here um, was it was AD sponsored and we wanted more eyes because of the obsolete, uh, obsolete path. We wanted more eyes on this. Um, I don't know how many on this call had a chance to read it. ADs have any. Ah, Warren's back in queue. So, uh, uh, Warren, comments. Hopefully, we can hear you now. My audio works this time. Yes, Anyone? it does. Yes. So, yeah, just Warren. to mention this was Warren originally Kumar. AD sponsored. Um, I took it over, and I think it should either belong in the Ops AWG working group or possibly Rob can take it over. Um, but I was mainly just holding it as an interim measure. Um, if that changes anything. And Rob, Rob? This is Rob. So I, my preference would be at this stage for this to go through the Ops AWG working group if there's sufficient support for the group. But getting more reviews and eyes on it is, is definitely a good thing to do. Okay, um, I uh, agree. I mean, that uh, Warren, back to you. Cannot hear you, Warren. Do what you did last time. Yes, now. Weird. Um, just saying that if it does go through Ops AWG, possibly we can expedite it. Um, but you know, obsoleting a document seems like it should be a working group action if possible. Um, the document, from my reading, seems not crazy. Um, and so if it does go through Ops AWG, it should be relatively quickly, I think. So that's just from an initial read. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree that, that I think it, it should go through Ops AWG and, and we'll, um, we'll submit it out there to the working group to see if, if there's interest in adopting and then moving this forward. And, and like Joey presented, it's got a lot of reviews already. Um, a lot of comments have been addressed and, and the authors feel that it's in good shape. So we'll, we'll put that out there for uh, the working group. Other comments so, um, or questions on the? Oh, but is this an um, AD sponsored document, or it's going to be adopted by Ops AWG? Currently, it's AD sponsored. It was AD sponsored by uh, Ignis. Um, it went through some uh, uh, directorate reviews, and there was a uh, comment that it probably needs more eyes on from people who are uh, from a PSAMP, former PSAMP that, that could give more of a technical uh, once over on this. And then there was the question of this obsolescence, which as Warren pointed out is probably something that shouldn't just be AD uh, sponsored, but should go through some working group due diligence. So right now it sits so with it, Warren. So it's a steel AD sponsor. So it's still with Warren right now, as okay. what Warren said, but uh, Rob is going to be the new person and we can put it up to see if the working group wants it or if it's going to continue on the AD route. I think that's the, the comments that's happened here. Yes, just to echo what Joe's said here effectively, that I think that if we can get to go through the working group, I think that's the best choice 
I do think that this work is sensible and I, I don't sort of have any fundamental issue with obsoleting 67, 28. I'm not that familiar with it, but I do see that we want to get Yang models right and it's okay over time if they're not been quite right, certainly the early ones to actually update them, fix them. So I think that's all fine. Um, if we can get this through the working group to get extra eyes on it, that would be great. If that's not an option or that doesn't work, then we could, then I could potentially look at AD sponsoring it. But if we can get this through the working group, that's definitely my preferred choice. Uh, and I don't see any reason why that has to necessarily be a long process. Uh, I think we could potentially move fairly quickly. So I'm not saying this needs to go back to scratch, but just that get it through the working group will be a better path. Questions or comments? All right, uh, G and Thomas, I'm sorry we've eaten well into the, we only got 10 minutes left for ops area. So I, I hand it over to, um, uh, first I'll say that if, if ops area wants to defer any time they can, but if not, uh, G and Thomas, you uh, have first dibs for slots in IETF 108. Uh, for Ops Area Working Group, and with that, I will hand it over to you, uh, Rob and Warren, uh, for your uh, remaining sort of 11, uh, nine minutes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Hopefully my audio is working. Um, so first off, thanks everyone, and welcome to the Ops Area part of the joint Ops AWG and Ops Area. Uh, I'd like to first start off by thanking Ignis for his service, and also say I'm really excited to have Rob Wilton um, serving as our new Ops and Management AD. I'm sure everyone will make them feel welcome. Um, and Rob, for those who don't already know you, I guess, could you take a minute or two and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, so for those that don't know me, I've not been participating at ITF for that long, so it might be possible that some of you don't. I've spent uh, over 20 years working for Cisco um, uh, more recently directly and before that indirectly as a software engineer in their service provider business unit. Um, so my background um, is on the service provider OS uh, across multiple platforms and things. Uh, predominantly in my early years was on layer two technologies, VLANs and Ethernet. Uh, but given the amount of time I've been working uh, for Cisco and the service provider, I have quite a wide background knowledge uh, across service provider OS um, and the software stack there. More recently, I've been focused on manageability issues and Yang, uh, particularly in ITF uh, and general system issues as well. Uh, in terms of the IETF stuff, I've been contributing for about the last five years or so, um, focusing predominantly on Yang and the related protocols. Uh, the NMDA architecture was one of the things I was heavily involved in. Then more recently, the Yang versioning work. In terms of where I see um, me as a management AD uh, going and the stuff that I seem most interested in is I'd like to try and uh, see ITF kind of finish the device level uh, Yang modules. I think that would be good. Um, I have a particular interest in the sort of um, service and network uh, Yang models and how those map down to the device level Yang models. Uh, I also have an interest in, in understanding what the relationship between, say, uh, the service level Yang models uh, or service level models being produced by. Uh, like MEF and how they map onto um, device models um, and network wide models. Uh, I also have an interest in the lifecycle monitoring and automation again. So um, all this stuff to do with actually monitoring how these networks are running and be able to up uh, to uh, find issues and fix them. Again, I have a keen interest in that area. So so that sort of summarizes uh, my background uh, fairly simply and the stuff that I'm I have at the moment uh, particularly interest in next uh, year or so. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so I think that this officially takes us into the um, ops area open mic time. Um, and if we don't have any, we might be able to get give a few minutes back to um, ops AWG. I'm not sure if they can fit another presentation in or not really in the last five minutes. Um, anyone have open mic questions for us? Doesn't look like it. So 
Of course, people can always email um, ops-ads at iutf.org if you want to reach us. And Joe, I'm not sure if you'd like to try and fit another presentation in in the last six minutes, or if there isn't really time. Well, we we slotted uh, G. I'll, I'll leave it to you. You're first in queue. Can you finish in five? Yang, can you hear us? He's muted now. Um, I, I, maybe it's it's best we uh, we adjourn here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Xi, you can be first. Like I said, you'll have first dibs at a at a crack in one oh eight, uh, followed by Tom uh, Graf, who also submitted after the the line had been cut. So I I, I think Warren, if you want to close us, um, we can awesome. uh, okay we can catch back up hopefully in Madrid. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for showing up. And I know the times were difficult for some sort of people. Thank you for staying up late or getting up early. And we will see you all at the next one of these. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you all. Hi, everyone.